Welcome. My name is Kasper van Lissa and I'm an assistant professor of developmental data science at Utrecht University, the Netherlands, and open science faculty ambassador at Selfsame University. Today I would like to tell you about research where I try to complement existing theory about adolescent emotion regulation development using insights derived from machine learning. The key challenge is this. Adolescence is a life phase that presents youth with new challenges in life and love. And for four in five adolescents, this promotes the development of mature emotion regulation skills. But as many as one in five instead experience severe difficulties in emotion regulation that lay the foundation for psychological problems later on in life. And because this problem is so prevalent and its consequences are so dire, both for the affected youth and society at large, there is a lot of research interest in this topic. But despite the abundant empirical research in this area, several authors have noted the lack of unifying theoretical framework. On this slide, I give you some sense of existing relevant theories, but note that these theories have several shortcomings. The research is fragmented across disparate areas, each area tends to use their own terminology. Few of them explicitly address the life phase of adolescence, and we cannot simply assume that theories about adults or young children will generalize to this specific life phase. Few of them comprehensively address potential predictors of emotion regulation, and these theories vary widely in scope. Some are mega theories, but they are somewhat nonspecific, which means that they can be used to explain basically any empirical finding and the other is very domain specific and thus lacks this unifying property. I would argue that the next step for this field is to develop an integrative theory. Now, according to Professor Denny Borsboom, the first step in theory formation is identifying relevant phenomena. And this is what we attempted to do in a recent publication. I developed a new technique called the text mining systematic review. This new method has several advantages over traditional narrative reviews. Narrative reviews often have limited sample sizes because human researchers don't have the time to read all of the published literature. Secondly, as little noted, narrative reviews suffer from confirmation bias as sentient readers tend to structure their understanding of the literature around pre-established ideas in the field. Text mining systematic reviews overcome these limitations. They can incorporate an unlimited amount of papers. They also follow a transparent procedure to derive results and that procedure is fully replicable. So this text mining systematic review can be easily updated or applied to a different field of the literature. In my work, I reviewed 6,653 papers on adolescent emotion regulation and found the following results. On the left, we see a network connecting important constructs mentioned in the author keywords of these papers. And on the right, we see a network of phenomena that were identified in the abstracts of those papers. Now, if you freeze frame and have a look at these results, you may recognize some of the phenomena that you are interested in in your own research. I find the results very relatable. So now we have some idea of the broad range of phenomena that might be relevant for adolescence emotion regulation. What is the next step? Well, I would argue, ideally, we would identify which of these phenomena make the difference between the 80% of adolescents who develop mature emotion regulation skills and the 20% that don't. But how to go about this? Should we include all of these factors as predictors in a latent growth model? Well, the problem with that approach is that we can only look at linear effects on the intercept slope or quadratic term of that growth model. And another problem is that these models are too complex to incorporate more than just a few predictors. Otherwise, the model will have low power and risks overfitting, thus producing nonsensical results. Should we then use a multi-group latent growth model? Well, the advantage here is that we can incorporate non-linear differences between growth trajectories, but the disadvantage is that we can only include one, maybe two moderators, and we have to dichotomize them, which loses potentially relevant information. Should we use a latent class model and include all of these predictors as auxiliary variables? It's a good idea, but in this case, individuals are only grouped with respect to similar growth trajectories, not with respect to the value on these predictors. A new solution is to use machine learning to identify relevant predictors of differences in growth trajectories. This method allows nonlinear differences between trajectories. It performs variable selection, which means we can include as many predictors as we want. And it incorporates checks and balances to ensure the results will generalize to new samples. So how does this method work? 
Well, very simply put, we first fit a latent growth model to adolescent scores on difficulties in emotion regulation, and then we use a kind of decision tree algorithm to split the sample based on the predictors into groups that are maximally homogeneous with respect to their growth trajectories. So the sample is split with respect to predictors to maximize similarity in growth trajectories. This algorithm was invented by Andreas Brandmeier at the Max Planck Institute Berlin, and if you freeze frame, you can see it explained in simple steps. The research questions in the present study are, first of all, what are the most important predictors of adolescents' trajectories of difficulties in emotion regulation? And second of all, what is the nature of the association of these important predictors with the trajectories? Our participants originated from the longitudinal radar study, which consists of 497 Dutch families of adolescents who were about 13 at the first time of measurement. Based on the text mining systematic review I showed previously, we identified 87 potentially relevant predictors in the dataset. Some of these were composite scales. The measures roughly fell into these categories. There are demographic predictors, biological predictors, Individual differences, such as personality, bis pass, and empathy. Many indicators of risk behavior. Indicators of relationship quality with parents and best friends. Both self-reported and parent-reported parenting scales. And conflict resolution styles with parents and best friend. The dependent variable was the difficulties in emotion regulation skills, so it's inverse coded. Higher scores mean more difficulties in emotion regulation. And we used 24 items of this scale. The scale had excellent reliability, was measurement invariant over time, and a simple quadratic growth model fit very well to the data. In line with open science principles, we used the workflow for open reproducible code in science to make this entire project fully reproducible, and you can access it at the link on the screen. Here's what we found. First of all, all 87 predictors were ranked in terms of how important they were to explain differences between adolescents in growth trajectories. Roughly speaking, what we see here is that individual differences scored very highly, notably personality, behavioral inhibition system, and empathy. Conflict frequency and conflict resolution styles also scored quite highly. But if we look at which variables scored very lowly, it's interesting to see that many of the usual suspects, such as parental monitoring, delinquency and substance use, and socioeconomic status, were all relatively less important predictors of differences in emotion regulation development. For the sake of time, I won't go too deeply into all of the results, but as I mentioned, these are available online. So what we see here are the marginal association of each predictor, sorted by importance, with trajectories of emotion regulation development. I plotted the expected trajectory of difficulties in emotion regulation for plus one standard deviation, the mean, and minus one standard deviation on each predictor. So what we see here, for example, is that adolescents who were one standard deviation higher than the average in neuroticism had greater difficulties in emotion regulation throughout adolescence. We also see that adolescents who had minus one standard deviation on the behavioral inhibition system also experienced greater difficulties in emotion regulation. Note that very frequently, it's just one of these levels that differs from the other two, and that suggests nonlinear effects of many of these predictors. Also note that for some of the predictors, we see very little differences. For example, for father age in the bottom left. This suggests that that variable's importance can be attributed to its involvement in some interaction. Unfortunately, we could not probe interactions due to computational restrictions, but if you have a good theory about what interaction that might be, let me know and I will run the analysis. Note that we reproduce the known sex difference that girls score higher in difficulties in emotion regulation, but the difference is very small. In sum, what have we learned? Well, the best predictors of trajectories of emotion regulation difficulties are individual differences, for example, in personality variables. By far the best parental predictor was autonomy support, operationalized as balance relatedness. Out of all the other parenting variables, the negative parenting behaviors, such as psychological control and intrusiveness, were most predictive. Conflict frequency and behavior were also very important predictors, as was a specific dimension of empathy called personal distress, being negatively affected by the suffering of others. Some variables were less important than we might have expected, most notably socioeconomic status, which scored the very lowest, 
bullying victimization, delinquency, substance use, and parental monitoring. If we reflect on the content of the findings, we notice something interesting. The most important predictors of difficulty in emotion regulation are either routinely assessed, such as Big Five personality, or overtly observable, such as conflict frequency and behavior. This means that these variables are prime candidates for the early identification of youth at risk for developing emotion regulation problems. Additionally, conflict resolution behavior is something that can be taught. So if this association turns out to be causal, then this may be a prime candidate for intervention. Another interesting finding is that the emphasis on parenting in the literature might not be justified. This finding is not restricted only to this machine learning analysis. It is something that me and some of my students have identified using several random intercept cross tag panel models, which after controlling for stable differences between families, find very little evidence for parenting effects within the age range of adolescence. At first we thought that those stable differences between families might be due to socioeconomic status, but the present findings also belie that interpretation. Perhaps we should look at biological predisposition or heritability instead, although these data don't allow us to check that. Also note that the order of importance seems to mimic Bronfer-Brenner's bioecological model. Specifically, we see that the most important predictors are at the individual level, second most are at the level of the microsystem, third most important are at the level of the meso system, and the least important predictors are at the level of the macro system. If we reflect on the form of the results, we note that many predictors show nonlinear effects, so there's only a difference for the group that scored least favorable on the predictor, but most favorable and average were very similar, and some predictors showed almost no marginal effect despite being somewhat important, such as father's age and drug use, and that suggests that those predictors might be important in interaction with another variable. At this point, due to computational restrictions, we cannot probe those interactions, however. Some of the limitations of this study are, first of all, that it used a weird sample. And the sample is also somewhat dated, as daily life has changed substantially for adolescents growing up post-pandemic. Another limitation is that this is a panel study, which included very limited biological and neurological measures. The sample size is also relatively small, so if you have access to a sample of over a thousand families, please get in touch and perhaps we can replicate these findings. The take-home message is that proximal factors are more important predictors of emotion regulation development than distal factors. Parenting might be less important than previously thought. Personality and conflict behavior are prime candidates for early diagnosis and conflict resolution skills might be a good candidate for preventative intervention. Thank you for your attention and please reach out if you want to discuss these findings further.